Uh, hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to uh, welcome to the lecture number two on acute coronary syndrome. Basically, this is the coronary syndrome, but this is much more acute. Uh, we talked about ischemic heart disease last time or coronary syndrome last time. I hope you guys understood the basics and uh, the risk factors and whatever whatever needed to be understood. Because in this lecture, we are going to talk about acute coronary syndrome. Uh, it's going to be a little bit of a long lecture, but remember, ladies and gentlemen, what you guys have to do is you got to have to pay attention a little bit because there's a lot of um, things that you need to understand very carefully and make sure that you can uh, understand the concept and basically apply that to your exams and your knowledge in daily life. So what is acute coronary syndrome? Acute coronary syndrome is basically consists of three components. It consists of ST elevation MI, non-ST elevation MI, and unstable angina. So basically these are representations on the ECG by increasing in the elevation in the uh, elevation in the ST segment. So that's why they're referred to as ST elevation, non-ST elevation, and unstable. The only thing about ST elevation is that the cardiac markers are positive in ST, non-ST elevation, the cardiac markers are positive as well. But however, in unstable angina, we don't have a positive cardiac biomarkers. So that's why it's negative in here. All right, so if you guys understood that, we're going to move forward. And we'll talk about it much more in detail in like a little later. But just for right now, let's get a basic idea of what's going on. What is some etiology and pathophysiology of acute coronary syndrome? Of course, we talked about last time that how the blood vessels are uh, narrowed and the, what are the methods that it can get narrowed and stuff like that. So basically, this is exactly talking about because there's atherosclerotic pathway and the non-atherosclerotic pathway, meaning the atherosclerotic pathway is like either there is a formation of lipid-laden kind of uh, plaques that are narrowing the arteries calcifications can happen due to the aging for example some sort of diseases that can cause calcified arteries and um, fibrotic uh, atherosclerotics can also possibly take place and cause a narrowing non-atherosclerosis is basically emboli that has traveled from somewhere else and it has been lodged into the coronary artery uh, mechanical obstruction for example trauma can cause uh, uh, some sort of aortic dissection or uh, aortic uh, wall ruptures and stuff like that and cause the um, non-atherosclerotic causes of coronary acute coronary syndrome increased vasomotor tone arth arthritis for example DIC can all all of these are the causes of cocaine which causes a severe vasospasm and it can lead to uh, acute coronary syndrome all right, ladies and gentlemen, so you guys are pretty familiar with that, and I know it's much easier because when we go talk a little bit more in detail, then it will get confusing, but just for right now, understand the basics of how acute coronary syndrome can happen. The history. Okay, so we can use this as a clinical presentation of the patient, how it presents, or we can talk about it in a way of history. Of course, the patient who has acute coronary, who presents with acute coronary syndrome to the emergency department is going to complain of sudden onset of chest pain, which is going to be persistent and it's not going to go away with pain and it's not, going to, I mean, sorry, it's not going to go away with like uh, inspiration, position or anything like that. So it's going to be a typical chest pain. Uh, pain will be radiating, for example, sometimes they will refer to it as a jaw, neck, interscapular area, or epigastrium, or sometimes even fingers. Um, what you have to do is just to find out, like, what is their background, past medical history, uh, do they have any family history, do they have any hypertension, for example, hyperlipidemia, diabetes, anything like that. So the risk factor, you got to assess that. Are they using any alcohol, have they been using any drug abuses, and any previous MIs, myocardial infarction. So after you get this information, after you get this information, you're going to go ahead and possibly do a physical exam. The physical exam will be like, on general, of course, the person who presents with a severe chest pain is going to be always agitated, restless, will have fever, or possibly they might be even hypothermic. And neurologically, of course, they might feel a little bit syncope because the blood is not pumping enough to the... Uh, 
to the brain and it's going to cause them to be feeling like a little dizzy and loss of consciousness might possibly pursue cardiovascular wise they can have hypotension or possibly hypertension because of the narrowing of the blood vessels and uh, lead to the decrease uh, hypotension it can happen because the heart could not be able to pump or hypertension can happen because the vessels are possibly constricted what about the white and pulse pressure it can happen white and pulse pressure as we said the white pulse pressure is the difference between the systolic and the diastolic uh, pressure right so respiratory wise they will represent present with tachnea, tachypnea, dyspnea, crackles. If we look at it, the physical exam of coronary artery, acute coronary disease is not as much important for us as much as what's important is for us to be able to tell that this patient is going through this situation. How am I going to take care of him? Of course, I'll have to do physical exam later, but at this point, I the most important thing that I have to do is I have to look after this patient and make sure that I save him from going to... Uh, heart failure or having a myocardial infarction and uh, com complete uh, death of his muscle cells. As we talked about in the last lecture as well, remember that geriatric patients, diabetic patients, and women are, uh, can possibly present with a silent MI and they can present with atypical symptoms. For example, sometimes they can present with fatigue, weakness, syncope, shortness of breath, or even delirium, altered mental status. All these are signs of like, if you see in these three type of population, just make sure you kind of exclude the possibility of them having any kind of uh, acute coronary syndrome. Of course, as a diagnostic test, we all know what we should order is a first thing. If a patient comes to you in the emergency department, the first thing you do is you're going to have to take an ECG because you this ECG is the one that it will help you to tell you that uh, you can basically you have ST elevation, non ST elevation or what's happening from without ECG. It's going to be hard for you to understand what's this patient going through. Of course, after the ECG we use a confirmatory test by taking the cardiac markers and we just take some uh, ancillary tests for example like CBC, BMP, BUN, creatinine, lipid levels and they say usually lipid level within the first 24 hours is much more sensitive compared to the 24 hours after the myocardial infarction. So let's do this after we take this we can just take sometimes APT to the uh, to see if there's any kind of risk of uh, bleeding that they might have later while we're providing with anticoagulants and uh, antiplatelets for these patients, okay? I just wanted to talk a little bit about serum biomarkers. Uh, serum biomarkers are very, very important because they are most confirmatory tests for uh, myocardial infarction in the MI patients. So troponin I and troponin T is basically it's usually they arise within three to six hours is their time of uh, that they can show up. So that's why the earliest you see is three hours. But four hours, I just want you to guys to remember the four hour rule. So the four rule of fours, usually within four hours, it's you can see that 24 to 48 hours they peak and within 14 days they go back to normal. <laughs> Troponin I and troponin T has usually a different day of troponin. Uh, they have different days of how it goes back to normal. But just in general, remember 14 days is the normal days that it will go back to normal. C, K, and B. Three to eight hours, you can see it. Uh, you can detect it. And 12 to 24 hours, it peaks up. And within three days, it goes back to normal. So this is a very good test if you guys want to detect somebody who has a reinfarction detect and reinfarction so if somebody just came um, to your emergency department and two days later they again uh, start to have this chest pain you want to might you might want to just take this and uh, this test and figure out if he has a reinfarction or not myoglobin is early but it's not specific one to four hours and 24 hours so because myoglobin is released from muscles and a lot of the time it's not specifics uh, okay, so this is the cardiac biomarkers. Now let's uh, go ahead, ladies and gentlemen, talk a little bit about the leads. There are certain leads that you might want to understand that if these leads are presented to you in the cases or in simple exams or in life, you get to see that these leads have some sort of elevation, depression. You should understand where exactly to look for and what is the possible diagnosis or where exactly this ischemia can be occurring at.
if you see a lead two three in AVF of course it's telling you that this person is having an inferior wall MI okay so if you see a lead one two three four anterior wall MI which is what artery of course left anterior descending artery inferior and uh, left uh, inferior wall MIs are possibly it's a branch of right coronary artery and it could be the posterior descending artery exactly or the marginal arteries but it's going to be more much more information will be provided to you but just as a big picture remember the right coronary arteries is the branch that is responsible for uh, the inferior wall mi all right and what about v5 v6 lead one and avl the lateral wall mi so you're going to be looking at what artery in here so lcx left circumflex artery and if it's v1 v6 and that's going to be anterior uh anterolateral wall mi possibly okay so v4 r is reverse basically leads it's in the right coronary artery too and usually it's a confirmatory test for right side it's uh, reverse of the v4 is reversed and on the right side and this tells that the right coronary artery is uh, somehow blocked and then the ventricle right side can possibly be infarcted so it could be anterior wall of the right side or inferior wall um, okay ladies and gentlemen so we're now going to go ahead and talk about the actual how we're going to present a case of acute coronary syndrome and how to take care of it or manage it if you're an emergency doctor or if you have this patient coming to you in the emergency department this is a little small case but in general I will talk to you a little bit more about it but I just wanted to make a bigger picture so you guys can understand how to how to tackle a case like this and in future how to be able to uh, um, kind of understand what's going on okay so let's read this case a patient is 55 year old presents to the emergency department with acute chest pain for two hours that started after she heard about the new pandemic in the usa that's which one is this coronavirus is that right yeah coronavirus has nausea and vomiting uh, shortness of breath and the past medical history is hypertension hyperlipidemia so right away you know that this patient is presenting to you with specific typical chest pain of acute coronary syndrome right that started two hours ago and she had it from a specific stressful situation that came on and she's having shortness of breath she's having nausea vomiting even though she has hypertension hyperlipidemic so her past history is also out there so what are you gonna do let's say as a physician now you're in the emergency department what are you gonna do of course you're gonna take some history from this person but before even you may get like a, a lot of history or torture this person with your history questions and all that you would want to go ahead and get an ECG correct depending on if you look at this patient how agitated they are and how restless they are and how how bad is the chest pain you're gonna get an ECG short just short form go ahead and get an ECG of course after you get an ECG what's the ECG gonna tell you is this patient gonna have either an ST elevation MI or is he gonna have a non ST elevation MI or he's gonna have an unstable angina so but if you get so next step is the ECG if we get an ECG and it shows that the ECG shows that we have an ST elevation MI correct if we have an ST elevation MI, it means, let's say, what is the criteria for that ST elevation MI? So let's say we have ST segment elevation of greater than one millimeter in two contagious leads. That's what it's called an ST elevation MI. And that's the uh, uh, explanation or the description of an ST MI, myocardial infarction, my, ST elevation, myocardial infarction. But you remember you have to have a greater than one millimeter mercury, sorry, one millimeter, um, two contagious leads, in two contagious leads, ST elevation, okay? Diagnostic tests, of course, we said we're going to get ECG. So we did the ECG. Next thing, what we're going to do is, of course, get the cardiac biomarker. Every eight hours, you get two sets. You get two sets every eight hours 
um, you get a CBC, you get a BMP, you get a lipid level, you get AP, APTT, and of course, BUN and creatinine ratio, BUN and creatinine as well, right? These are all just the tests that you might want to get, like to get uh, things, get yourself ahead of everything like that. So we got the ECG, we detected that this patient is um, an ST elevation myocardial infarction. So this possible, this guy is now in trouble. What is your situation? What are you going to do? So of course you see this person, he's, we'll see him. This is how we're going to start our treatment. Before we send this guy to the actual final treatment, which for example, for ST elevation myocardial infarction will be to stent this guy to open that blood vessel and let the blood go through. Of course, before that, we have to stabilize him, right? While waiting for revascularization. This is what it exactly means. So while we're waiting for revascularization, we're going to do a couple of things. First thing we're going to do is give him oxygen if he's hypoxic, especially if his O2 is less than 90%. We're going to give him aspirin, stat. This is what stat, aspirin, okay? 325. Let's say you have an exam, and in the exam, they ask you the patient presents with typical chest pain of myocardial infarction and... Uh, you know that this patient has acute coronary syndrome what would you do first would you do an ecg or would you give them an aspirin of course you're going to give them aspirin because aspirin decreases mortality by 25 percent in real life of course they don't usually go ahead and give somebody aspirin like that they just go ahead and do the ecg and then finally after they figure out that there's something um uh, the ECG is basically abnormal, then possibly they can give him an aspirin and uh, go ahead and uh, take care of him later. But in exams, aspirin comes first before even ECG. Okay, so 325 milligrams of aspirin is usually given, and uh, clopidogrel is the next antiplatelet. Uh, therapy that is going to give in these two are antiplatelet therapy remember in ST elevation myocardial infarction we got to give a dual antiplatelet therapy and this two are referred to as dual antiplatelet therapy one is COX-2 inhibitor um, yes this is a COX inhibitor and this is a clopidogrel is a P2Y12 ADP platelet inhibitors that inhibits the formation of uh, co congregations of the platelets to uh, form with each other and form a complex. And this is the dual antiplatelet therapy that must be given to all patients with ST elevation myocardial infarction that presents with that. Of course, we want to decrease the preload by giving them some, some uh, lingual nitroglycerin of 0 0.5 milligram every five minutes up to three doses and possibly with IV doses uh, as well if needed if the chest pain is uh, not better. But however, remember ladies and gentlemen that the nitroglycerin is the decreaser of the preload. Let's say if somebody has already got something like sildenafil, as we guys know the nitroglycerin and sildenafil can decrease the blood pressure to a very lower level, right? And it can cause a possible uh, problem for the patient can lead to the hypotension so this is why we have to be careful if the patient has for example right heart failure we need loading of volume not decreasing the preload okay so we need to give more pre more preload in order to push the blood to the left side so sildenafil use within 24 hours if somebody has severe sten aortic stenosis or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy we got to be very careful and we cannot give sublingual nitroglycerin that point you guys gotta have to remember very very good another thing is beta blockers and so the next we give them beta blockers to decrease the demand of oxygen by decreasing the heart rate right because if the heart rate is decreased the work heart cardiac um, muscles are going to work uh, less and then the oxygen demand will be much lesser morphine sulfate we give about four to eight milligram to decrease the anxiety and decrease the uh, it actually congestion in the pulmonary system as well so it makes them feel much better with them, uh, just by giving them a little bit morphine sulfate and of course IV anticoagulation to decrease the formation of uh, clot and uh, to decrease basically uh, coagulation formation into the 
in the vessels and um, help the patient further now the main thing is this was to get to the patient to the revascularization position so we got him all set up with this following medications give him oxygen give him aspirin give him clopidogrel give him some lingual nitroglycerin then we nitroglycerin we give him beta blockers we give him morphine and IV anticoagulation and fraction heparin or low molecular weight heparin. Depending, we give only low molecular weight heparin if the kidneys are fine. If they are not fine, then we can use unfraction heparin as a, an oxyparin, for example, as a medication for that. All right, so now the final management has to come. So we get the guy, we go to the cardiac consult, we get the cardiac consult, admit the patient to the cardiac care unit, and the cardiac care unit is going to decide whether to give PCIs or thrombolytic. Of course, the only time you can give thrombolytics is if we don't have PCI. If we have PCI available, boom, we're going to send the patient directly to a PCI um, a unit and then a percutaneous coronary intervention unit, and then they will give them... Um, the, P, the PCI will be done to them. The, usually the normal uh, concept of time for PCI is that the patient from the time they enter the emer emergency room to the time they're going to get ballooned, it's about 90 minutes or 120 minutes if the PCI is about uh, in another hospital that can be given 30 minutes extra of um, uh, transporting the patient to that area. Then uh, the same thing with fibrinolytics is that the door to needle time is only about 30 minutes, but within 12 hours of onset of symptoms, it can be given. Um, there's um, PCI has like a your age, if you have a lot of like the, age, the higher the age of the person, the more complications and the lower the efficacy. But however, um, it's possible then their new methods and techniques have been uh, here and they have shown much improvement in these uh, complications of the for aging people. Um, how do they do the PCI? They either do it through a femoral artery or radial artery. So let's say if a patient is on COVID in and um, they have an INR of greater than 2.2, which of these fall? Which of this will be either this or this will be better for uh, access? So of course the radial access is much better. It's less complication, easier to take care of hematomas that are around the arm compared to the pelvic uh, area, pelvis area where the femoral artery. Uh, can be possible hematomas can be very complicated and hemorrhage can be much more than radial axis and with more uh, INR you can possibly do it easier through radial axis all right so some of the uh, some of the uh, fibrinolytics are fibrin specific and non fibrin specific is the streptokinase and tenecteplase alteplase or reteplase these are fibrin specific this is non fibrin specific and basically they break the cloth up if and that's all about you need to know and uh, what are some contraindications before you give um, fibrinolytics you guys must understand that prior to prior intracranial hemorrhage is a contraindication a known cerebral lesion or arteriovenous malformations are basically contraindications um, any malignant lesions around the in the brain any previous stroke within three months is a contraindication active bleeding or bleeding diathesis as another uh, contraindications hypertension that's greater than 185 and not controlled with emergency therapy um, these are all or facial or closed head uh, closed facial traumas is also another contraindication and that's about it so let's say now you have treated the patient with either PCI or uh, fibrinolytics right so you have to get this patient get discharged um, upon discharge you're going to give this patient of course we know 80 aspirin that's very common and dual antiplatelet therapy as we said the dual antiplatelet therapy is going to be continued for about exactly um, one year so this is one year therapy after a myocardial infarction that must be continued especially the clopidogrel is continued and then after that you can take off one and leave one if they if it's required high intensity statins are required for treatment beta blockers and less 
remember we just forgot to say it I forgot to tell you guys ladies and gentlemen when we were providing beta blockers in here right here you must understand that if the patient had acute CHF acute CHF you should have stopped you shouldn't have given you should not give him the beta blockers because this can possibly lower his uh, heart rate and cause severe hypertension and hypotension and lead to um, hyperperfusion of the organ systems and stuff like that so now we said that unless CHF or shock is present you don't give beta blockers in that situation but if they're not present then you can possibly give them beta blockers and keep their heart rate around 50 to 60 uh, cardiac rehabilitation of course you're going to refer them to for that and smoking cessation very important ACE inhibitors ladies and gentlemen for patients with reduced ejection fraction especially if they have a lower than 40 percent you have to consider with using spiral lacton with that as well and uh, this is about it and uh, i hope you guys understand the st elevation myocardial infarction part uh, because it's very very confusing and sometimes it can be very confusing if you don't understand it but overall let me just go ahead and quickly just review this one more time before we move on to the ST segment non ST segment elevation um, acute coronary syndrome we said consists of three parts ST elevation myocardial infarction non ST elevation myocardial infarction and unstable angina we're talking about ST elevation myocardial infarction so in ST elevation myocardial infarction the first thing we do is of course the, we take the ECG of the patient right so this is how we're gonna do it the patient we do take the ECG of the patient the ECG must show a greater than one millimeter merc greater than one millimeter of uh, increase in ST segment elevation in two contagious leads and uh, once you get that confirmed you're gonna have to get the um, get the cardiac biomarkers which is troponin and I troponin and T and CKMB and myoglobin and some other blood work and you send that uh, lab work to the lab to get that as soon as possible of course now you're gonna prepare the patient for revascularization while waiting for revascularization you're gonna go ahead and see if the patient is hypoxic you're gonna give them oxygen you're gonna uh, give them some um, aspirin about 325 milligram and clopidogrel which is the dual antiplatelet therapy that you must remember that you have to give to any um, ST elevation myocardial infarction patients and then you give them sublingual nitroglycerin and then you give them beta blockers remember beta blockers are on, uh, with acute CHF and you also remember sub -nitro sublingual nitroglycerol with patients who have uh, these contraindications for example right heart failure, sildenafil use, aortic stenosis or HCM and then uh, morphine sulfate can be given to decrease anxiety, IV anticoagulation as well for example heparin can be given to them as well and then we have PCI versus fibrinolytics and of course this is much better but if you don't have this you use fibrinolytics and uh, the most important thing is that after PCI you have to place, place the patient on dual antiplatelet therapy for about one complete year another thing is ladies and gentlemen we must talk that there's two types of patients that we have to remember I've totally forgot to tell you guys about but if you are sending a patient with um, for coronary angiography, right, in an ST elevation myocardial infarction patient or a chronic kidney disease, if they are, if they are, um, if they have chronic kidney disease or they are pregnant, uh, you have to be worried about pregnancy and chronic disease because you have to tell them the risks, chronic kidney disease, and the risk of uh, radiation to the fetus for and then for chronic kidney disease you have to let them know about the contrast use contrast use so this is very important that you must remember that if you're sending for patients for coronary angiography or cat labs so you have to inform them it could be an ST elevation or non ST elevation but this is just a main concept that you guys must understand and uh, that's about it so now we're going to talk about non ST elevation myocardial infarction what does it mean it means that ST elevations are not elevated however there should be the cardiac biomarkers that are increased right so if the cardiac biomarkers are increased what are we gonna do go ahead and admit to the cardiac care unit or telemetry we're gonna admit this patient 
of course we're going to do the same way of pat the same pattern for like uh, preparing this person for either revascularization or an invasive therapy or medical therapy but however at this specific time because his cardiac biomarkers are high we know that there might be a myocardial infarction that's going on or there could there is myocardial infarction that's happening because the markers are high if it is high so we give them aspirin same thing 325 milligram we're going to give them clopidogrel similarly we're going to give them oxygen especially with nitrogen less than 90 percent of oxygen saturation beta blockers again contraindication to beta blockers a chf acute chf basically we might we have to give them statins and the nitrates sublingual nitrates and iv anticoagulation so you see we did not change anything from the ST elevation myocardial infarction with this one we give them the same medical therapy however how are we going to figure out if this guys are going to go ahead and require catheterization or coronary angiography or they're just going to be uh, guided with ischemic guided therapy so basically uh, how this is how we're going to work this out so after we have this we're going to go with something called we have to figure out with Timmy America. This is risk stratifying and patients with Timmy America. So we're gonna go ahead and uh, get this person's the Timmy America is the mnemonic for age greater than 65 markers elevated ECG elevation greater than 0 0.5 risk factors ischemia in the past in two episodes of angina in 24 hours coronary artery disease of uh, stenosis of greater than 50 percent known stenosis aspirin used in the past so this is called timmy america this is a risk stratification to guide us to see if we're going to pay send this patient for an early invasive treatment or we're going to go ahead do a guy in ischemic guided therapy by for example doing a um, for example we want to do a cardiac uh, perfusion test or cardiac uh, test to determine uh, the what's happening with the v blood vessels and the heart even though you guys see that there is a possibility that this guy's heart could be damaged but at this point if their timmy scores is less we have to go with there's a five percent chance of death or mortality so we're going to go go ahead and do an ischemia guided therapy what is ischemia guided therapy it means we have to go ahead to the heart and do some perfusion tests to see the basically stenosis of the heart vessels and see what's happening with that okay and if there are three to four there's about 20 percent the timmy score is three to four there's a 20 percent chance of death and then early invasive test is the most important thing that what is early invasive means coronary angiography coronary angiography or cat labs and then we go send them to the cat because if this is they're blocked and their narrow arteries are narrowed greater than 95 or 90 percent we're just going to stent them out there and there's 20 percent chances if they have five to seven they have about 40 percent early invasive therapy this stands out for you know ladies and gentlemen when i talk about non-ST elevation myocardial infarction and unstable angina they come in the same pattern so you're going to be treating them almost similarly this is why we're doing to risk stratify these patients and go ahead and see what how much is the percent of mortality they have and what can we do for them of course if somebody has non-ST elevation myocardial infarction of course they're going to fall into Timmy score of greater than five to seven right and we have to do an invasive therapy for them but if somebody has unstable angina and they might fall into this so ischemic guided therapy will let us know that does this patient needs early or late invasive therapy or some sort of medical uh, guided therapy that we can control that patient on or possibly cabbage for later some others that possibly require early invasive is greater than three of course timmy score grace scoring system uh, greater than 140 recurrent angina hemodynamic or electrical instability high risk stress tests heart failure ejection fraction less than 40 percent pci within six months or prior coronary artery disease and these are the ones that also require uh, basically um early invasive treatments or coronary angiography or cat labs that we're going to send them to 
Well, if you're sending somebody for a cat lap in a non ST segment elevation myocardial infarction, we're going to give them uh, group 2B, 3A when we're sending them for stent stenting. Usually it's called a Bex. A Bex. A Bex. Simap. This is the medication that can be given and it directly inhibits the platelet formation. So uh, this is a good medication to basically provide them with when they're sending them for st uh, stenting. All right, so this is a good understanding of how, again, we're going to talk about, like, let's say we have an acute coronary syndrome patient. We're going to have to do an ECG. Is the ECG telling us is it STS elevation, ST elevation MI or non-ST elevation MI, most importantly, or is it unstable angina? Correct. And um, just a quick review of what's going to happen right now, ladies and gentlemen. So of course, we do an ECG. We did an ECG first for both ECG and the ECG stated that we have this. The first thing we do is we're going to go ahead and get a cardiac biomarkers cardiac biomarkers after that we're going to get some cbc some blood work and bmp and all these other blood works right and then follow that by um, basically uh, preparing this person for revascularization give them o2 give them aspirin give them clopidogrel clopidogrel give them nitrates sublingual nitrates and nitroglycerin give them morphine and give them some beta blockers if they don't have acute uh, chf and iv anticoagulation that's correct and then move further with pci versus fibrinolytics now the similar method applies to the uh, non ST elevation MI, we do an ECG cardiac biomarker, of course, cardiac biomarker, similar things oxygen, uh, ASA, clopidogrel, and um, IV infraction, IV anticoagulation, and then, for example, um, beta blockers, nitroglycerin, sublingual, and then uh, that's about it for right now, of course. And then we're gonna go ahead and risk stratify this guy with Timmy scores. After we get this guy with Timmy scores, Timmy America, that's what it is, stands for, right? Uh, if it's greater than, if it's zero to two, 5% chances of dead, we go guided ischemic guided therapy. And uh, three to four, course and five to seven high risk so these are the high risk 20 percent chance of death early invasive catheterization some catheterization and that's about it and this is the exact same that's going to happen the only thing is in here the cardiac biomarkers are negative and in here the cardiac biomarkers are positive but still the same method applies the same way down to the um to here so nothing is different just the same pattern of um treatment and uh, uh, monitoring of these patients but so just for your purpose of knowledge ladies and gentlemen make sure you guys understand the differences between these two uh, major events and uh, also understand how it's going to affect the patient in a long term when the patient gets discharged they're going to ask you if they're going to be able to sexually active uh, ability for sex right now at this current point if there is a right you can do basically the short form is that if you want to do you can risk stratify the patient into risk stratification by putting them into low medium or high risk patients by just risk stratifying them by doing a stress testing um, or you can just go ahead and if they have a right wall uh, basically a right infarction, right side of infarction, infer right in wall or right inferior, inferior MI, basically you go ahead two weeks restriction and anterior MI, anterior wall MI, 
six weeks restriction. If it's low risk, of course, two weeks less, two to four weeks, or greater than six weeks. That's about the same thing. High risk is, of course, patients who have if I mean, any kind of arrhythmias, uh, CHF, ejection fraction is less than 40% and all these things that you can consider uh, recurrent angina symptoms and stuff like that. <coughs> but thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you guys understood a little bit about acute coronary syndrome. It is a, I know that it's a very, very uh, high yield topic. And for you to understand, you have to repeat this over and over again and kind of like remember to do your own um, basically um, research if there's anything that needs to be updated about this uh, coronary artery disease. And in general, this is all it is for this exam. So hopefully it helps you guys and um, you'll be able to um, do good and have a great time. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.